Okay. Thank you, everybody. I can see that you are enjoying the conversations. That's also another purpose of this uh, workshop. Really glad to hear that and see that. So now I would like to invite Fernando on stage to talk about IPv6 security and uh, you know, bust all those myths that people might have so you can take them back to your teams and tell them this is how it really is. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Good. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's really uh, a, a pleasure, my pleasure to be, uh, pleasure to be back here in, in London. It's my uh, first long trip uh, um, after the pandemic. So it's kind of like, kind of like nice. So, um, and thanks Veronica team and the UK, CP, uh, the UK IPv6 Council for the invite. Um, it's super nice to be here. So um, this is a presentation about IPv6 security and myth busting. So the idea, what we'll try to do is essentially cover a lot of topics associated with IPv6 security, but in particular, you know, some that are well known to be, uh, so some that are well known that people ha have them wrong, okay? So super short uh, introduction about myself. I work as a security researcher and consultant. I did a lot of work at the IETF. Uh, most of it, I think, is more than that. Uh, it's about IPv6. For the most part, they are like uh, changes to the protocols to uh, address security issues. Um, and also, I offer a toolkit for doing security assessments on IPv6, okay? So, what is the motivation of this presentation? So, for newcomers to IPv6, normally you get to hear a lot of myths around the protocol, but also specifically about security, okay? There's also myths that have nothing to do with security, like IPv6 providing like improved quality of service, et cetera, et cetera. We are not covering those because those are not security related. But when it comes to security, you may have heard things such as, okay, IPv6 is secure by default because security was considered during the design of the protocol. You may have heard things such as, okay, with IPv4, we have network-based security, and with IPv6, we will change that to host, like whatever that means, like host-centric security. Um, all the things that you might have heard about that with IPv6, we will have like increased IPsec usage for whatever reason. And um, another you know, myth surrounding IPv6 is that it will return the end-to-end -end property uh, you know, to the internet. Um, the idea is that you know, all of these myths generally have like a negative impact because firstly, they set, the, you know, they set incorrect expectations. And quite often, you know, when people don't get to analyze these things because they just don't have time, like quite often IPv6 is just one more item in a table full of things. Uh, the problem with you know trusting the things or you know taking the things for granted is that a lot of you know uh, uh, deployments don't uh, end up not caring a lot about security because they assume that you know all of the security issues are you know already solved. Um, so we will cover most of this, and obviously I'll try to analyze you know my reasoning for actually claiming that these are actually myths rather than facts. Okay. Uh, uh, I explicitly like added some slides meant to be controversial. So please, when we get to the you know the Q and A uh, you know slot, feel free to object, ask questions, or you know offer your point of view. That's the, the intent of this presentation. And before we actually you know get to discuss like technical you know aspects of IPv6, I'd like to cover or talk a little bit about some aspects that are associated with IPv6, but not necessarily with its you know technical details or the the, the, the corresponding protocol specifications, because quite often uh, you know these aspects end end up having like a big impact on the you know security of the emerging deployments. Okay, so. Interesting aspects about IPv6 security is that we have much less experience with IPv6 than with IPv4. Obviously, with any tool, the more you know the tool, you know, the better you are with it. That's a fact, even if the tool is not that good, okay? But your proficiency with the tool actually has an impact in, you know, the security of the, you know, emerging deployments. All the things, uh, IPv6 implementations are clearly less mature than their IPv4 counterparts. I would probably argue that the maturity of many IPv6 implementations are you know, equivalent to the maturity of some IPv4 implementations in the 90s, early 2000s. Like, you know, like basic bugs with processing packets, et cetera, et cetera. So you'll see that both bugs being fixed, but also like a lot of CVEs, like vulnerability advisories with 
simple things such as you know, uh, some implementations being unable to process malformed packets, for example. Other aspect is that security products, like there's a you know, whole range of them, uh, normally have less support for IPv6 than, than for IPv4. And here, you know, the, the, this statement is a little bit tricky because when it comes to support, in some cases you might think of feature parity, which obviously is a thing, but also there are cases in which a vendor will tell you that, yeah, our device is able to do the same thing for IPv6 but I, than with IPv4. But what they don't tell you is that at times they implement the IPv4 functionality in hardware, whereas they implement the IPv6 functionality in software. So in theory, do they have the same you know, they, um, uh, parity of features? They do. In practice, can you actually use it? Not really. Okay, so that's important. Uh, another aspect is that the you know, complexity of the internet as a whole obviously you know, uh, increases. Like, you know, from the very beginning, we will have like, or we have already like two internet working protocols, IPv4 and IPv6. We have, you know, increased use of NATs, whether we like it or not, CG NAT, NAT64, different versions of it. And also we have increased use of tunnels too. So this means that as a system, the internet becomes more complex. And, you know, complexity is always, you know, not very friendly with, you know, security. Uh, lack, but not, last but not least, um, there's a lack of well-trained human resources. So normally, if you are working in a team with, team, with let's say, 10 people, most likely they are you know, well-skilled when it comes to IPv4. If you ask you know, the same kind of questions about IPv6, maybe not so much. And that's a fact, OK? And whether we like it or not, you know, IPv6 is the only thing that we have on the table. And you know, for a lot of companies, it's the only option that uh, we have or they have to remain in this business. And what I'm trying to say, like, let, uh, let me just try to make my, my point clear here, is that this slide is not meant to you know, suggest that you should walk away from IPv6, which some people might read it in that way. But uh, actually my intent is to essentially make it clear that there are gaps in a number of areas and that if you are not working on them, you should probably start doing that. That's kind of like the idea. So let's start with now the technical bits, okay? Uh, obviously, since there were like a lot of presentations about background, I'm assuming like you have that background. Uh, but in most of the cases, I will provide just a one slide of background to get everyone on board. On board, you know, if you're uh, still not there. So extension headers. If you look at the let's say the general format of an IPv6 packet, it's supposed to be something like this. Okay, so you have the you know the mandatory IPv6 header. On the, you know, on the right hand side, you have the upper layer protocol, in this case TCP, and in the middle, you are supposed to be able to insert as many extension headers as necessary to be able to insert options in the packets, okay? And the claim is usually that this structure is such a good thing because it makes processing the packets much more performant. That is like a claim that you will normally hear. Um, but not so much. So what happens is that this kind of you know, packet structure is okay when you are like, let's say, processing packets with like a general purpose CPU, but when you are talking about hardware architectures, this is not very friendly. That of having variable size like headers, the, you know, fields spread all over the place, not very friendly with hardware architectures. Now, what happens when, um, you know, if you think about like, um, let's say a hardware implementation. This could be, for example, like a network router. Quite often, even when you know, a lot of people like to think that a router will just look at the IP addresses to route packets, quite normally they do much more. They have to you know, enforce ACLs, sometimes you know, do load balancing depending on you know, the ports in use, et cetera, et cetera. So these devices, these middle boxes, whatever they are, load balances, routers, firewalls, whatever, they need to actually learn uh, what's the upper layer protocol, what are the port numbers involved, et cetera, et cetera. And because of the structure of an IPv6 packet, the only way in which you can do that is like walk the packet structure as a linked list. So you start in the IPv6 header, and from there you can jump to the second extension header, and so on and so on and so on. There's nothing like a pointer to the upper layer protocol. That thing doesn't exist, okay? Now, normally, uh, hardware implementations uh, have at least one or two different kind of limits, okay? One of the limits could be in the number of headers that they can process, so how many headers they can jump onto, okay? 
That's one of the possible limits. In other cases, and this is in the vast majority of cases, they have a limit of how deep into the packet they can you know, uh, pick into. This is because, well, short version of the story, they copy a piece of the packet, of the beginning of the packet, into a super fast memory for packet processing, and obviously that memory is expensive, so there's a trade-off involved. So they might have something like, for example, 64 bytes, or you know, it could be like 16 bytes, or whatever that is. Now, the thing is that if you get to actually insert extension headers in this way, you might hit this limit. You might hit these limits. Now, the question is, what happens if, you, if that's actually the case, okay? So when uh, you know, a packet hits that limit, there's, there's like a number of options of things that this device could do. Like some devices, for example, they send the packet to the general purpose CPU, the same one that you use for the control plane. Probably it should be clear, not a nice idea. Uh, that's one of the options. So it cannot be processed in, you know, in the fast path. It's sent to the, you know, to the uh, um, slow path. Another option is just pass the, pass the packet, so I couldn't process, so let's get the packet through. And option three is that they drop the packet. Now, there are a lot of implementations that do one and two, and obviously the implications are obvious. If you put the packet to the you know, general purpose CPU, given uh, you know, a number, large number of packets, you can do a denial of service attack. And in option two, is just because the packet has a lot of extension headers, you are going to let it through, well, quite likely attackers are going to insert those headers because you know, they will try to circumvent your security controls in that way. So that's a, a, a situation that you know, we have right now. Obviously, option three is the way you'd like to go or should be going, but obviously that has a, uh, there's a trade-off involved because that means that if packets are of a certain, they have a certain length for the extension headers, you end up dropping them and now this feature uh, becomes unreliable, okay? Because you know, the more extension headers you include, the, you know, the higher the chances that those packets will get dropped. So, Brief overview of what are the implications of uh, security implications of extension headers. First one, evasion of security controls. This was covered in the previous slide. You know, if you just insert enough extension headers, there are implementations that let the packet, you know, let the packet pass. DOS uh, as a result of processing requirements. Again, some architectures they send the packet for processing by the you know general purpose CPU. That is a super bad idea. But other uh, security implications are some that have to do with implementation errors, and this might be awkward, but if you look at the number of bugs that have, you know, that have affected IPv6 implementations, quite a lot of them have to do with not being able to parse like a packet with extension headers. It's unfortunate, but it is what it is. Uh, and the final one are issues that are, like, you know, uh, are related with the specific extension headers, like an obvious example would be at some point in time there was a routing header type zero, the equivalent to IPv4 source routing, and obviously there are issues associated with those headers, okay? Now, question is, uh, and I'm being pragmatic here, so not everyone might like my advice, I'm just saying what I would say if, you know, if my brother would ask for, ask for advice, this is the advice I would do, I would give. So advice on extension headers, particularly if you are deploying IPv6 on an enterprise, first of all, analyze your extension header requirements. For the most part, you are not, having, you are not going to have a lot of them, probably fragmentation that you might use for the DNS. You might, for example, need IPsec if you establish tunnels from your enterprise, but there's not a, a lot more than that. And as you might expect, everything that you don't need, you drop it, okay? A lot of people might not like this. Now, if you are responsible, you know, if you work in the security team, uh, uh, you know, of an organization, this is a no-brainer, essentially. Uh, next topic, IPsec. One of the, you know, usual claims is that uh, with IPv6, we would get, like, increased usage of IPsec. Uh, when, I tried, when I was trying to dig, like, okay, how come that these people made these, you know, these claims? And you know, apparently the thing boils down to the fact that several years ago in one of the, you know, in the node requirements RFC, that was essentially a formal requirement in the spec that said that if you had an IPv6 implementation, you had to implement IPsec. Implement, not use, okay? So that from the very beginning, that doesn't you know, guarantee like you know, increased IPv IPsec usage. 
aside from that, even when the requirement was in the spec, nobody really cared about it. So you really had like a lot of IPv6 implementations which didn't ship with IPsec support. And at the same time, you had IPv4 implementations which ship when, with IPsec support even when it wasn't a requirement. So eventually the IETF did the right thing, like you know, align the specs with like the real wall, meaning that they remove their requirement, okay? So that there's no even a reason nowadays to expect in any way that you'd get increased usage of IPsec. But, but it's actually uh, slightly worse than that. Because in the IPv6, IPv6 world, IPsec, IPsec is uh, implemented as an, with an extension header, okay? And because of what I was mentioning before, there are a lot of networks that simply drop packets that contain extension headers. So you shouldn't be surprised if you are in an IPv6 network and you are trying to establish an IPsec tunnel and you realize that it just doesn't work. It doesn't work because you know a lot of systems, they just don't like packets with extension headers. So actually it's the other way around and you might, you know, you probably should consider like alternatives or you know, other, yeah, possible options to actually, you know, implement this kind of tunnels because doing like native IPsec might not work as expected. Okay, next topic is IPv6 addressing, okay? Um, obviously, we all know that, you know, the main driver for IPv6 is the larger address space. You know, as a kind of summary, you know, we have IPv6 addresses that are 128 bit long. Um, one thing that is, you could say, special or different for IPv6 than for IPv4 is that in the normal case, every system will use a combination of multiple addresses with different properties. Whereas in the IPv4 case, normally you just get one address, whether that's a private address or a global address, but just one. In the, IPv6, uh, in the IPv6 world, you might normally get like one link local address, one stable global address, one temporary global address. So a number of addresses of different combinations of, of, of these properties, scope, time, and, and lifetime. And uh, finally, as a, you know, uh, to, to finish this introduction to uh, IPv6 addressing, you know, the, the typical size for IPv6 subnets is a slash 64, okay? Now, obviously there are different types of addresses which we could, you know, talk for hours, but the only, you know, address type that I'm going to briefly cover is GUAS, global unicast addresses, because these are going to be of use for the rest of the analysis. Essentially, GUAS have this syntax, a global routing prefix. Obviously, that's what your, for example, uh, RIR, in the case of provider independent you know, a space, or your ISP might provide to you. Subnet uh, ID, which is obviously similar to um, you know, what you have in the IPv4 world. And interface ID, which is essentially the same thing as the host ID in IPv4, okay? So similar structure, you know, the only difference is like different size for each of these fields. Now, the only field for which we have something like a difference when it comes to IPv6 is the interface ID. And the basic idea is that you, we normally have like 64, 64 bits there. And when you give humans like a lot of options, they, you know, it, that triggers their creativity and come up with something different to do, whether that's useful or not, okay? So how can like interface IDs be generated? So option one is to generate them manually. So you just configure the interface ID, and at the end of the day, you could put in the interface ID whatever you wanted. Some people do things such as embedding an IPv4 address in the interface ID. That's useful so that you don't have to remember the, you know, the, the, the matching between IPv6 and IPv4 addresses. Other people, for example, for servers, they do, they do low byte addresses, interface ID in all zeros, you just change the last byte. And there's people that do more you know, fancy stuff like you know, inserting words in the interface ID. That's the manual configuration, but you could do anything there. And then there's the automatic way of configuring addresses. So the, you know, the, the original standard was to embed, essentially embed your MAC address in there. We got rid of that. Like if you look at any general purpose operating system, we don't do that anymore. Then there's option two, the standard that replaced the original one, which is RFC 7217. Which, you know, to put it uh, simple, in a simple way, it's a hash of the prefix and a secret key. 
it's slightly more complex than that, but that's the, you know, the, the easy uh, explanation of it. And finally, you can configure addresses with, you know, uh, via the DHCP version 6 server, and the algorithm is like, you know, implementation dependent. So it's up to the, uh, up to the implementation what to do in there. So, uh, this was kind of like the background or in, in introductory stuff or background information uh, to be able to go through the, you know, what actually matters, which are the security aspects associated with IPv6 addressing. So, first topic is uh, address scanning, okay? So I'm removing a lot of you know, historical changes in here. So I'm, I'm providing like a snapshot of what's the current state, so to speak. But at the end of the day, if you think about you know, IPv6 networks and you, think, uh, and you try to analyze whether it's possible to scan them or not, essentially you have two different you know, uh, possible scenarios. Scenario number one, uh, you know, the interface IDs are randomized, so the search space is huge. There, you have no chances whatsoever of actually you know, doing a, a network scan in there. And then you have option two, which is a network that employs patterns for the interface IDs. That could be like using low bytes, setting the interface ID to all serials and just changing the last byte or something like that. In which case, you know, the address scans might be feasible. Now, whether, you know, if you're faced with a situation like, for example, you're a pen tester and you're asked, you know, like, you know, scan our network, it's not straightforward to tell if you are going to be able to do that or not because of a lot of aspects. First of all, there are different mechanisms and different algorithms for setting the interface ID. And also quite often in different scenarios, different protocols and algorithms are, are used. Like some scenarios could use Slack, which normally leads to some things. Some other scenarios might be employing the HCP version 6 and the situation might be different. But this is kind of like, you know, the, the, the um, let's say the, the, the problem space, so to speak. Now, trying to summarize, again, this is not 100% true, I'm just trying to summarize things here. If you are talking about scanning uh, for workstations and mobiles, for the most part, you know, they are using Slack, and in which case, you know, the interface IDs are going to be randomized, so you should be like ultra lucky to be able to find devices there, but, if they happen to be in a network that employs DHCP version 6, then you know, it might be feasible to scan them because a lot of DHCP server implementations just you know, lease addresses for, from a small address pool. So it's the, 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 the addresses are actually super clustered, okay? Now, for servers, it's usually much easier because either you have like manual configuration and most people are like sane enough that they, they don't just enter some random numbers in the interface IDs, but they use low byte addresses or you know, stuff like that. So they are most likely uh, employing address patterns. So in that case, it will be feasible. Uh, or they might be using the HCP version six. As an example, GCP, okay? Addresses are uh, assigned with uh, the HCP version six. So there are clear patterns in how the addresses are assigned. In that case, obviously the, the address scans will be feasible. And if you happen to target servers that are employing Slack, which from my perspective is way more uncommon than the other, you know, than manual configuration or the HCP, in that case, it's likely to be unfeasible because with Slack, the interface ID is normally um, uh, randomized, okay? Advice on uh, IPv6 address scanning. So the first question is like, well, should I care about this? Like, should I care or should I just pick any addresses and it's all fine? So from my perspective, like, you know, uh, network reconnaissance is like a key phase of every attack. So anything that you use to make the life of an attacker harder, it's most likely a good thing for you. Okay, so all other options being equal, then yeah, if you could prevent or mitigate scanning attacks, that's a good thing. But of course there are, you know, sometimes there are limitations and or trade-offs. Because for example, you know, you could have like in your enterprise, you might be relying on a specific DHCP version six server that they use predictable, you know, they list addresses with a predictable pattern. So you might want randomized addresses, but maybe you can't with the software that you're using. Or for example, let's say you might be using GCP and they use DHCP version six for leasing addresses. It is what it is, okay? And there are also cases like, for example, if you have like a whole bunch of servers, some organizations like to select the addresses by, for example, embedding the IPv4 address in the interface ID. So there are like trade-offs in there. 
So it depends on a, you know, on a case by case uh, basis. Okay, um, another aspect related with IPv6 addressing is end to end connectivity. So obviously we all know that the whole point of IPv6 is that it has uh, you know, enough global addresses for every th single device or thing on this planet, okay? And there was a lot of people that assume, or maybe still assume, that just because we can actually uh, uh, provide uh, global addresses to every single device, that necessarily means that that will return end-to-end -end connectivity, meaning if you are connected to the internet, you can reach out any other system on the network. From my perspective, that's a super bad idea, and what I would suggest, particularly for an enterprise, is that you deploy IPv6 in this kind of way, you uh, you know, you assign global addresses for your network, for your devices, but you still have a device in the border of the network that enforces security policies. Now, if you wonder, okay, well, there's a firewall in there, now what would I do with that firewall? Well, the obvious thing, uh, thing if you don't know better, like if you don't have a case for something different, I would say only allow outgoing connections, and that's nice because that matches the model that we have, you know, from IPv4 in a good way, okay, no surprises in there, and and if it's really if, if it's necessary and also possible, you know, use temporary addresses for you know within your network. Might or might not be possible. And if you need to, you know, allow incoming connections, just do it on a case by case basis. Not just not let any random device on the internet connect to your IPv6 devices. Another obvious example is like if you have an IPv6 enabled home. Would you really want any random device to actually ping or connect to your smart TV? Most likely not, right? Um, okay, this one I added like an hour ago or something just for the sake of controversy, okay? It was like, uh, <laughs> it wasn't there, but uh, I, yeah, I realized that it would be like good for discussion. So ULAs, okay? So uh, the basic idea of ULAs is that you know ad are addresses that are of course not globally reachable. Okay, so when the scope of the address is non-global, call it whatever you want, that means that you know if you are using ULA space in your network, in principle, I cannot reach your network, and that is like you know a, a, a direct consequence of addresses being scoped. Okay. Uh, so this provides some level of you know, prophylactic security, like some level of isolation that has to do not necessarily with filtering itself, but by the property that the, those addresses are not really valid you know, in other parts of the network topology. So um, properties, of, uh, you know, properties arising from the use of ULAs. Uh, first one, isolation. So if I'm using, for example, ULAs in Monday where there's no NAT device in there, just to be clear, it's just a router, okay? If there is some attacker on the, you know, on the public internet trying to get to my network, well, quite likely, you know, it's not going to be, uh, oops, possible, because, you know, it's just uh, another space that the attacker won't be able to reach most of the time, okay? Oops, uh, there we go. The other one, which has to do with stability, that depends on the specific deployment case. But let's consider the case, for example, where you are, uh, if you are using, for example, ULAs, and your connection with your ISP, upstream router, or whatever that is, you know, uh, gets cut off, then if you are using ULAs, your, your address space is completely independent from what your you know, ISP is providing you. So in this case, you are okay and you can continue using the same address space. In a lot of cases, if what you are using in your internal network is address space that is being advertised by your you know, upstream provider, if you have an outage with your upstream provider, you know, eventually that address space will time out and all out of the sudden, you have no address whatsoever, okay? So there is like a case for ULAs. Then there's the side question. Are the implementations good enough for this to work properly? Well, that's a different question. But in theory, it should be okay, in theory. Uh, now, obviously, this wasn't controversial enough, so I, uh, this was the one that you'd hate. This was added on purpose. So there are people that do this, okay? It's like, okay, they use like private address space or like ULA space for a local network, and they connect the local network to the IPv6 internet with an ad. And I, you know, obviously I understand that you might be saying like, what the hell, like, you know, all this mess of doing IPv6 just to replicate what we were doing with IPv4. 
And I share the sentiment in a way. But the, let's say, if you look back and you try to you know, understand why people do these things, well, at the end of the day, this is a well understood model that matches what they do with IPv4. So it's not about technical virtue, it's about like dealing with something that you know. And just as a spoiler, if you wish, uh, you know, that's how the you know, Kubernetes IPv6 support is implemented. Why? Well, the people working on the IPv6 support were not really IPv6 experts. So there were two options, do something that could mimic IPv4 and they could understood quite well, or going through like hundreds of pages of specifications, which probably wasn't like a, a sensible thing for them to do. I'm not arguing in favor of this. What I'm saying is that this kind of thing happens, and you know, in a way it's understandable, not from a technical perspective, but you know, it's a human factor at the end of the day. It's, uh, you know, whether if you are given the choice of working with something that you know versus something that you have to learn from scratch, a lot of people will pick the option that they know better. Whether that's good or bad, that's a different question. Um, another aspect um, you know, related or associated with IPv6 uh, addressing is uh, the change in the, uh, or the possible change in the security paradigm, okay? So for me, just a spoiler, this doesn't make any sense at all, but I read it from a number of places, so I said like, you know, let's bring it up here. So there's people that argue that, you know, since we are giving global addresses to every single device, and they are proponents of that of not having network-based firewalls, they believe that, you know, we should remove all kind of security controls from the network itself, and actually implement those controls in, on the host devices. Like for example, if your organization has like a network-based firewall, get rid of that firewall and implement host-based firewalling. Now, from my perspective, even the, the question is not really valid because in the IPv4 wall, you don't have like a network-centric security. You have like network-based firewalls, but you also have like, you know, host-based firewalls. And I think that it has been like that for ages. So uh, I don't believe that um, you know, that's going to be like any different. Uh, I do believe that there is uh, a case for having like, you know, security controls both in the network but also in the host, like defense in depth, if you wish. And uh, you know, in the IELT era where you have like um, uh, implementations that just to say it politely are like suboptimal, and that they are unlikely to be uh, updated. So you, don't re you really want to have something in the network to actually at least filter you know, the, the gross of the stuff. Um, so I would say no changes in here. Next topic is uh, ACLs, okay? Enforcing access control list. For me, this was a no brainer, but I happened to find myself in a conversation with a large a content provider, and we were talking about security, and they made a comment on how they enforce ACLs, and I said, well, but you don't do it that way, right? Because that doesn't work. I was like, okay. And for me, it was like a little bit of a, well, maybe it's not really, you know, it's not obvious for everyone. So um, actually we are, you know, working on a, a ETF draft on this topic, but I'm trying to summarize, you know, the topic in here in these slides. So. Access control lists are a you know, core component of doing security operations, okay? So you do things like, for example, allow lists where you, know, you have a device, some sort of resource, and you only allow access from uh, a given prefix. And you also have things such as block lists, which is obviously you, know, you allow everything else and block specific offending you know, uh, 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 prefixes or devices. Side comment in here, I'm just porting the way we do uh, ACLs in IPv4 to IPv6. The question of whether you should rely on I ACLs or not, it's a different question, okay? So, you know, one uh, key aspect that you need to analyze when, uh, you know, when thinking about ACLs in, um, in IPv6 is what's behind an IPv6 prefix. And when I'm saying IPv6 prefix, I'm, I'm referring to it like in a very general way. It could be a slash 128, which would be like a single IPv6 address, or it could be like a slash 64, a slash whatever, okay? So, one thing, uh, one, uh, thing to note is that you could have like multiple addresses that actually map to the same host, okay? And this is because, for example, when you're using Slack, it's quite normal that you have a slash 64 in your network, 
and every single device like picks addresses from that slash 64. And not just that, with the use of temporary addresses, those addresses change frequently, okay? So it's same device in the same slash 64, changing the addresses all the time. On the other hand, so that means multiple addresses may map to the same device. But on the other hand, you might say, okay, well, but if I have like an address that maps to a single system, right? Well, not really. Because whether we like it or not, we do have different versions of NAT in the network. So you could have multiple systems uh, behind some sort of NAT device, okay? Some sort of NAT device, whatever that is. And as a data point, that's what Kubernetes does, okay? Doing NAT for IPv6. Whether we like it or not, that's a different question. So this is kind of like the, let's say, the context or the background, okay? Multiple addresses may correspond to the same device, and actually we could have one single address, and behind that address there are multiple devices. Um, and obviously these things are key when you are trying to enforce ACLs. So let's try to briefly discuss the challenges for uh, a low list, okay? And let's consider the case, for example, of what happens when you have a network where hosts are using temporary addresses, okay? Temporary addresses essentially means that, you know, each host is randomizing, you know, at least one of its addresses and the address is changing all the time. And also, if there are multiple hosts in the same slash 64, actually there's all the addresses are intermingled. Okay, because all of the systems are changing their addresses and within the same slash 64. Now, the question is, if you want to implement an allow list, what do you actually allow? Okay, because the obvious thing that you might want to do based on, you know, the, or porting the same knowledge from the IPv4 wall is just say, okay, I just allow the access to a single address. But we are saying here that the addresses are changing all the time. So, if you just allow like a single slash 128 in a matter of a day or more, you know, that ACL is going to fail because the, you know, the address of this host is going to change. What about block list? Okay. So with block list, I mean, there are multiple things that you might be doing, but one of the things that you might be doing is that you might have some sort of, you know, uh, IPS and it gets fed like, uh, um, let's say, a list of offending addresses. There are multiple ways to do this, multiple platforms, multiple sources, and so on. One example could be, like, for example, fail to ban, which a lot of people run. You run fail to ban, if there are multiple fail attempts to, I don't know, SSH login, you just ban that slash 128. Uh, there are also the, uh, you know, uh, reputation services such as Abuse IPDB, and there are others, okay? All of these platforms, normally what they provide you as output is a slash 128. That's the input that you get in your you know, IPS or firewall uh, as a hint of what you might want to block. Now, the question is, so we got a 128 from you know, any of these sources, but what should we really block in here? Because um, if you just block a 128 and we, if we are saying that, you know, if you are using Slack, for example, a system could pick a new address from the same slash 64, you know, as fast as it wants, then the device, my, the offending device might actually intentionally change its address all the time. And for example, if what you do is uh, add like slash 128, eventually you will exhaust the list of possible entries in your filtering device. That's one possible thing. The other option is that, you know, the attacker, what he or she could do is configure a new address, try the attack once, and then just after that, move to a different address. So actually you don't get the chance to see like multiple fail attempts because the attacker is changing the addresses all the time. That's a super easy way to, uh, for example, circumvent things that such as, you know, fail to ban or a lot of sites and applications that do some sort of rate limiting, okay? So there are challenges in doing um, a low list and in doing blog lists. So what could we do? I'm not saying that anything of what I'm going to mention here is nice. It's like the best I could come up with, okay? I'm not saying it's nice. So for a low list, we don't have a lot of options. So if uh, one of the options is to use only stable addresses, which could mean like use manual configuration or use the HCP version six, 
or use Slack, but for example, with domain policies, disable the use of temporary addresses, in which case each host is supposed to have a stable you know, address, and in that case, you can configure the allow list to be a slash 128. The addresses are not changing all the time, but each host has a stable address. Now, another possibility is to embrace the usage of temporary addresses, and in that case, you don't have many other options than to segregate the systems. So every system will pick addresses from a slash 64. It is what it is. So you could, for example, give a slash 64 to each device, and then you enforce the ACL on based on slash 64s, not on slash 128s. Is it nice or no? I'm not saying it's nice. There's not that many options, right? For block list, it's tricky because, um, you know, as I mentioned before, an attacker can be like changing addresses all the time. So eventually you have to have some form or some way of actually aggregating the ACLs and say, for example, if I have a slash, I, I got an offending address from a slash 64 and now I have like 100 addresses in slash 64 that are attacking my device, well, I probably want to ban the whole slash 64, okay? So you want to do some sort of aggregation. You get multiple offending addresses, and then eventually when you reach uh, some threshold, what you do is you aggregate all of them into, for example, a, a slash 64. And uh, this is, again, this is not a proposal. This is just for brainstorming purposes, if you wish. And the idea, uh, this is simple stuff. Like what you do is, the idea here is to have like different levels of aggregation. So we start with a slash uh, 128. And the idea is that when we get, like here, 10 addresses in a slash 128, what we do is we aggregate those 10 addresses into a rule of the next level, which in this case is slash 64. The numbers are for the most part random. So if you wonder, okay, well, is 10 a good number? Probably not, but it could be like 100, could be 1,000, could be whatever. So you get 10 addresses, uh, 10 128 uh, you know, prefixes, meaning addresses, so you aggregate them into a single slash 64. Now, let's say that you now have multiple slash 64s that belong to the same slash 56. Eventually, you want to aggregate those slash 64s into a single slash 56. And normally, what you do is, for the resulting ACLs, most likely you want to reduce the amount of time that, uh, that you're going to use for the ACLs because, you know, the impact is going to be, like, larger. Um, I have two topics to cover super quickly. One is automatic configuration. So this one has been covered. Uh, there's Slack, there's the DHCP version 6. Um, Slack is a bit of, you know, configuration anarchy. With Slack, you, you know, you advertise some information and it's hard to, you know, come up with you know, or figure what's going to be the outcome. Uh, on the other hand, DHCP tends to be more, you know, enterprise friendly. It matches what we have in IPv4 but Android doesn't support the ATP version 6. So options are like keeping separate networks, for example, for one or the other, and if for the systems that you have, like using Slack, what you can do is, for example, use uh, NDP monitoring to actually build your list database, better than nothing, okay? Um, Finally, you know, if you're going, because normally this is a big deal, like, okay, well, there's Slack attack, we have to do something about it. My reasoning is simple. Ask yourself if you are enforcing controls for ARP and the HCP version 4. If you are not, then there's no reason to do the same thing in IPv6. If you are, use whatever, you know, mitigations you have available for IPv6, RA guard, the HCP snooping, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, that's it. And these two slides I'm going to cover in one minute. One, this one is important. Uh, some people say, well, this is complex. My network is IPv4 only, so should I care about this? Well, you should care because most of the systems that you have in your network, they have IPv6 support enabled by default, so there's not really something like an IPv4 only deployment, so you should do something about it. And the final one, just to keep you thinking about this one, is VPN leakages, which happen a lot. Typical scenario, you have a VPN, uh, you have VPN software, that only handles IPv4, you happen to connect to an IPv6 network, you get IPv6 connectivity, but your VPN software doesn't support it. So whenever you connect to an IPv6 endpoint, all the IPv6 traffic leakages out of the VPN. 
even in 2023, there are still vendors that you know suffer this problem. So, any time for questions, complaints? <laughs> I think there was, I think there was enough controversy in uh, Fernando's talk. Well done for 45 minutes. I guess okay. Andre is gonna go first. Okay. Hey, Andre Zalitka. Um, regarding uh, network-based firewalls. Uh, what do you think about, or what do you what do you think about ISPs doing this blocking of incoming traffic to IPv6 that they provide to their customers, especially residential customers? Do you think it's okay, or do you think it's something they shouldn't be doing? So what I believe that they should do uh, is that they should conf they should ship the home router like the uh, CPE with a filtering policy that only allows outgoing connections. Not filter at the ISP level, but filter on your device. And why? Because we are technical users, so if we want something different, we can you know, override that configuration. But for the most part, users, it's like IPv what? So, and, but just to tell you a story, I once had a, like a, 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 a phone IPv6 available in, you know, in a place, so I wanted to you know, leave a, a, a Raspberry Pi so that I could access from outside, and I couldn't. So I happened to have friends in, the, uh, in this ISP, and I told my friend, like, hey, guys, are you actually like, blocking incoming connections in the CPE? Not that we know of. So I think that in a lot of cases, they don't even know what they're doing. <laughs> so it's like they ship whatever the manufacturing is provide, providing, and it is what it is. But I believe that the CPE should enforce a policy of only allowing ongoing connections. Hello, thank you very much. It was a lot of good information in there, especially the piece about the VPNs. I forgot to mention that, so thank you. Um, I feel as if there's a lot I can talk to about security in this. I mean, we, when, we, when we conceive security today versus when we started putting things together years ago, we didn't think in the same way that we do around zero trust now. And I feel like there's a lot of opportunity with IPv6 to start thinking how we apply that to the network as well. Worth noting. Of course, I want to talk about ULA and translation. And my, my, my biggest concern here is that if we get into a situation where we as experts say, well, okay, someone's going to do this translation of, of ULA into GUA, well, maybe we should, uh, maybe we should help them. I, I, I would really love it if we could all collectively say, no, that's wrong, and here is why. Because <laughs> the last thing I want to do is, is actually let people into a situation where they start expecting there to be network translation in IPv6. I don't want to go down that path as fast as possible. But one lasting question for you. When you say ULA is quite useful for uh, segregation, you mentioned about the, uh, the potential attacks with extension headers. Mm -hmm. How safe is ULA from those attacks? So I would say I would drop the extension headers anyway. It's like, you know, uh, you, it's unfortunate, but it's like... It's you're not supposed problem. to drop all of them. <laughs> Sorry? You're not supposed to drop all of them. No, all of, not all <laughs> of them, but for the most part. If you look at it's like a simple security principle. Like, what do you need of that stuff? Normally, it's you need only fragmentation and maybe IPsec, except for hop by hop on the local network. Excellent. Sorry, I'm just trying to get the uh, next speaker. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad that Tom mentioned the ULA because I'm, I was getting really itchy, you know, it's done. <laughs> All right. Uh, just one uh, tiny no. comment. In the, <laughs> uh, the B6 Kubernetes implementation was done with ULA, and what, uh, it's done with ULA, it's like a uh, big vendor. And what I said was like, I understand, what I'm trying to say is, I understand why they did it the way they did it, but actually I contacted the implementers and say like, let's try to do it differently. That sounds like a good solution to me. Thank you, Fernando.